provare. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Good afternoon everyone. Sono Ciro Di Lanno, co-founder di Mirta. I am Ciro Di Lanno, co-founder of Mirta, and I am extremely happy to introduce the three panelists we have. Um, we're going to deal with a topic that is close to our heart, uh, sustainability. Most likely in this period, sustainability is being used as a bit of a, of a mantra. Everyone talks about sustainability, and everyone tries to in a way, um, sh show and compete to show who is uh, uh, most uh, sustainable. At Mirta, we are dead serious about this. It, we took one and a half years to try and figure out what sort of approach uh, we want about this. We tried to summarize in three macro pillars. Number one, it's the business model. Second is planet, and third is people. Because uh, to us, sustainability it does not mean just one thing. It means uh, approaching it uh, full round. When it comes to business, um, well, at Mirta, we are convinced that um, being sustainable means boosting local businesses who are deeply rooted in the community but can reach out to international marketplace. Fashion has been based on um, local traditions. We've heard many times that fashion is harmful to the planet, but uh, what we see actually is a destruction of local productions uh, that are disappearing, and we want to prevent that from happening. We also um, produce based on, um, you know, meat to meat order. So we basically um, produce only following orders, trying to avoid overstocking and overproduction. Then, talking about the planet, we uh, produce products that are designed to last long. And when that doesn't happen, we work with companies and with our clients to try and uh, provide maintenance uh, to these uh, products uh, to give them a new lease of life so that they can last even longer. And third, people. We work with many craftsmen and we are convinced that it is fundamental to attract uh, new generations to our cause. We work with schools, we work with young people so that they become passionate about this job and this is kept alive. This is quite a complex uh, topic, uh, and it is also multifaceted. I am extremely happy today to introduce you to uh, two entities that can uh, provide us with a wealth of information on two different areas. On the one side, we will hear from uh, Fabiana Orlando, the um, the head of the sustainability accounts of UNIC. So she will tell us whether uh, leather is sustainable. And then we have the founder of Renovo, a wonderful uh, project to repair products, to make sure that they can last much longer over time. That is to say, Carlo, Claudio Gianquinto and Lorenzo Quattrino. And I'll give the floor to Fabiana. Thank you, Ciro, and thank you, everyone. Welcome to this chat we are having about uh, sustainability. Today, we're focusing on leather and the sustainability of its supply chain. Ciro was saying that uh, sustainability is quite a complex uh, uh, concept. It started off clearly with an environmental um, component, but then things evolved. Mind you, uh, sustainability has been evolving over time. Here, you see an overview of the sustainability reports of the, the main Italian tanneries. There have been 18 um, reports or financial accounts or better sustainability accounts. 
And so that speaks volume to our uh, commitment. When we started off, um, the focus was only on the environment and only subsequently we included the social component and only later on we acquired a sort of uh, a more general overview on the latest reports. We also wanted not only to provide uh, just um, numbers and figures, but we wanted to give you a little bit of context. So we really wanted to share with you um, all of the stories linked to sustainability. And as of 2019, we decided to try and share our commitment to improve uh, sustainability. So we adopted uh, as an industry the uh, 2030 agenda and the relevant goals. Now, let's get into the nuts and bolts of this new approach to sustainability and the UN Agenda 2030 applied to a supply chain. Well, it means looking into the main sustainable development goals where we need to focus on. We focused on tanning and tannery, but each step of the way can have an impact on these goals. We also need to learn in terms of impacts, but also positive impact. And this is something we can learn from the big uh, companies. Worldwide, uh, there is this concept of having an impact, which can also be positive. In order to truly be sustainable, you mustn't uh, limit yourself to uh, avoid harm, but you need to generate value. You need to make your contribution to improve uh, results uh, globally. So here you see just a cartoon or a or a chart of that. I'm not getting into the detail because I would need an entire day to illustrate this. The 2030 agenda, if we focus only on the tannery, um, you, you get an idea of the areas that are impacted. In the 2021 report, we tried to aggregates the topics related to sustainability in four macro areas. We started off from materials because you can't talk about the sustainability of a process without taking into account the outcome of a given process, that is to say leather. And so the Italian Association of Italian Tanneries focused on a number of concepts that uh, are quite important. And, uh, you know, they have always been factored in by small enterprises and small uh, craftsmen, but they somehow got lost along the way. During the years like uh, 2020, we found ourselves in a position to reaffirm that weather is, uh, excuse me, leather is a natural material. It is not a vegetable, it is of animal origin, but it's 100% natural. It is renewable because livestock rearing is renewable and is perfectly uh, compatible with renewable resources. Then there is also another important element linked to the sustainable uh, trains and sustainability, that is to say durability. Leather is durable. We took it for granted in a way, but mind you, finished leather is a product that uh, comes from a, the byproduct of the food industry, really with the exception of reptilians, uh, because uh, leather is much more uh, valuable than flesh. But think uh, cattle, think pigs or, um, or sheep. Well, all of these animals are never 
killed uh, because of their leather, of their hides. There are some uh, documents that have developed uh, projections of the environmental footprint of the leather industry. They modeled the so-called allocation of impacts. Even before the slaughterhouses, the impact of uh, uh, the allocation of the impact with um, rearing, for instance, for dairy uh, cows, for instance, you consider 100% of livestock uh, rearing, 80% uh, um, in, is, um, has an impact uh, on uh, milk uh, production, and uh, um, only 3.5% um, is uh, the value of the leather industry. So. There is no reason for saying that a given animal is uh, culled or killed because of the leather. Another important idea here is uh, basically providing evidence of the following. When discussing sustainability, in order to avoid uh, greenwashing, but also help people reflect on the claims and communication, well, what we say must be truthful and transparent. If I say that a material is leather, I can only call leather a material that has some characteristics. In Italy, but also in Portugal now, there are some rules, there are some regulations that um, imposes or allows the use of the word uh, leather only for some materials. Leather has a 3D collagen-based structure which is created by nature. It's not produced artificially by uh, men. And only materials that preserve this type of structure can be called leather. Otherwise, um, producers who call other materials leather might be prone to um, penalties. Furthermore, um, there are no real substitutes for leather that has uh, the same technical performances. Some similar materials might be used to produce uh, shoes or bags, but their performance is radically uh, different. I could tell you more about the natural components as well. A number of research um, has been performed, and if you consider, say, 100 carbon content, you see that natural materials contain some 25%. The rest uh, is the um, collagen and the solvents to keep together the, um, the materials, the different materials. So really, we need to learn a bit better, uh, to be uh, better informed, and uh, really wonder whether alternative materials uh, to leather truly are sustainable. So we really need uh, to, demand, uh, for, to demand more information. And then the judgment is up to consumers, ultimately. We discussed sustainability, but to make things easy for you, let's say that sustainability has an environmental and economic and social component, and it also has an ethical dimension. Without getting into much detail here, the slide is just to remind you um, of some figures and data related to Italian uh, tannery. The tanning industry um, is really um, an excellence uh, worldwide. Many detractors say, oh, look, leather is produced in third world war, um, in the third world, uh, um, exploiting children. And if you put tannery in Google, you will see that they show um, Moroccans uh, um, that uh, basically walk on feet in order to uh, walk on hides in order to um, to treat them. But that's far, far away from the reality. Uh, it uh, accounts for 63% uh, of hides produced uh, in Europe, but also uh, worldwide, Italy accounts for a share of 23% of the values of all commercial hides. So Italy, with its top-notch um, production, 
really is uh, at the cutting edge of uh, Made in Italy. Now, what do we mean by sustainability of the material? Well, it is about economic uh, sustainability, but also social sustainability. What does that mean? What is the role of leather? What is the role of the leather supply chain when it comes to supporting local communities? So we uh, monitor some indicators because when we talk of um, sustainability, we need to really assess things carefully and you, you, you can't discuss or talk about sustainability unless you have indicators and figures. So, you know, one can claim they are green, but then you need to provide numbers. Have you improved? Fine, show me what were your numbers before and what they are now. Here you see some indicators. Since uh, tannery uh, production is uh, physically quite demanding, it is important to keep an eye out for female employment or the percentage of uh, foreign workers, or also the ability of the industry to maintain permanent contracts um, and permanent workers. And this also through, for instance, a collective bargaining, uh, which is applied to, um, or to tanneries. Social responsibility also entails checking the sustainability over time. A business or a line of business must uh, clearly be uh, sustainable and in order to do that they must have sufficient workers and this is a problem we share with the fashion world that is to say our workers aging and it is not easy to pass down or pass on the know-how and the craftsmanship across the generations and we also have a huge uh, problem in terms of engaging, hiring young people in this uh, industry. We have many young people who want to be fashion designers, stylists, but we have very few people who want to actually engage in tanning. So as you can see from numbers here, we have an age problem and five years down the line that could uh, translate into a sustainability problem, I mean the progressive aging of our population. What is the point of this monitoring? Well, it gives us the following message. In order to keep being leader, we need to work now to fend off uh, potential criticalities, criticalities. So we really need to focus on hiring young people. We need to improve our communication and we need to find a way to make sure that different generations talk to each other. And it, it is also key to make sure that the know-how of the uh, senior in the industry are passed on to the younger generations. Uh, apologies, says the speaker. I struggle to, um, um, you know, to keep the slides going. Right. But this is not uh, sufficient. I mean, providing work is not uh, sufficient because um, work must be based on the respect of workers' rights and constant improvement of human resources as well as involving them. Manufacturing is moving this way. Human resources are increasingly important in manufacturing and um, also um, our workers must, you know, give their contribution in terms of idea and uh, development of a number of aspects. So, when discussing the social aspects, it is uh, fundamental to have criteria and to have systems that can provide better uh, welfare. And indeed, uh, our workers must be properly valued. 
Now, let's get into the, the heart of sustainability. We talked about numbers, we talked about indicators, and now let's da deep dive into the environmental component. Here you see three indicators that we've been monitoring for a long time now, and we get an idea of the impact of our sector and of the ongoing improvement. These three indicators are the energy consumption, the chemicals consumption, and the water consumption. And below, you see the the outcomes, if you want, of this uh, commitment in terms of energy consumption. You've really invested a lot. Please consider that um, this improvement was achieved with uh, minor technological improvements. In terms of chemicals consumption, well, that is uh, more complex and more difficult because by changing some processes, you need to change the entire process. It's not that if you reduce the consumption of chemicals in a stage um, necessarily in the next uh, stage or the following stage, you would use uh, less. Here you see other um, indicators. There is a QR code uh, where you can download the whole report. This is just to give you an idea of what we monitor. What is it that we monitor? Well, we monitor the amount of waste, the type of waste, whether it is um, hazardous uh, waste or special waste, how much goes to the landfill, how much is recovered, and here you see um, an idea. And when it comes to the impacts um, on water, we measure the residual uh, pollution in the environment after waste water has been discharged from water treatment uh, facilities. When we discuss environment, clearly you um, must um, focus on uh, what is most uh, topical uh, today, especially in the light of the EU Commission's objectives. And so um, the question ultimately is what is the contribution of health to climate change? in terms of emissions. We are currently monitoring two indicators. One is the level of CO2 equivalent, and clearly oh, we measure this on a yearly basis. And the second is the emission of solvents into the air. But there's another aspect we keep an eye on. That is to say, the use of renewable uh, energy in our uh, production. The figure for uh, 2020 is more than decent. Uh, almost 73% uh, of electric power used by Italian tanneries uh, came from renewable sources. 73% accounts for 10.5% uh, of the total share of energy consumption. So in terms of the contribution uh, to uh, climate change, you see that the uh, improvement is quite striking. We discussed uh, the concept of uh, durability. Um, and here, the key is the role of uh, circularity. We discussed byproducts and leather being a byproduct of the food industry. Well, I guess everyone here knows the European Green Deal, which is the strategy designed by the uh, European Commission in order to decarbonize Europe completely by 2050. In order to implement this strategy, the EU Commission identified a number of uh, key points to achieve the goals. One of these key points is the circular economy. So, ultimately, it is a new economic paradigm, and it envisages the recovery of uh, byproducts and waste as much as possible. The idea really is to reuse waste and produce as little waste as possible. Also, according to the concept of a circular economy, it is fundamental to 
to give a life, a longest possible life to materials. The Green Deal also contains important uh, action plans uh, that impact on uh, leather processing especially the sustainability of building and energy production and also the farm to fork strategy. This is quite a massive program of the EU Commission. It aims at banning all chemical fertilizers and replacing them with organic uh, fertilizers produced uh, with uh, waste biomasses. And I'll tell you why that is so important. What is Europe doing at the moment? Well, the EU devised this strategy, but for a strategy to be implemented, you need investment. So here's what Europe said. Okay, I devised the strategy, but in order to basically encourage um, the economic system to invest in R&D and implement the strategy. Well, they uh, devised a number of tools to make sure that investments are funneled towards this, towards the Green Deal. In particular, there is a regulation which I invite you to read, that is to say Regulation 2020-852. Now, this regulation defined uh, what we mean by circular economy, and they also provided uh, some uh, criteria for uh, defining a sustainable uh, economic activity. So, basically, they defined a taxonomy. Um, so, when we discuss a circular economy, a criterion for defining uh, an economy as uh, uh, sustainable is to have um, to have the value of products, materials, and other resources in the economy to be maintained for as long as possible, thereby reducing the environmental impact of their use, minimizing waste, and the release of hazardous chemicals. We discussed durability as well, which means having a lasting product. And the tannery uh, transforms a, a perishable uh, product, that is to say animal hides, into something that can last for a very long time. So, you see, uh, ultimately leather is a durable material. It can last for a very long time and through maintenance, repairability, and also potentially disassembling a product uh, which components can be used for other applications. This uh, guideline is really very interesting and it defines industry by industry. You also have a small leather goods, a tannery and a footwear. This is meant for uh, financial operators and they, it clearly defines what it's meant by um, leather goods, uh, tannery, etc. So basically, it describes uh, um, the European um, criteria for granting funds as well. This is a very important document. It was uh, published in the form of draft. Um, there was a call for evidence in September, and soon the results will be published. And uh, mind you, the indicators and the criteria for sustainable finance were provided uh, in this document for the environmental component, and another document focuses on the social social component. So, um, so the social component and the environmental component go hand in hand. We mentioned briefly the circular economy, but let me 
ask you here, why can we consider leather a circular material? Well, for starters, it is very durable, but also we can manage quite easily the end of life of leather in a circular mechanism. I don't want to give you a science lecture, but this is just to help you understand what is the mm, material cycle, what do plants do? They build their proteins in their tissues from CO2, nitrogen and water. They synthesize um, proteins, vegetable proteins. Such proteins are eaten by animals and then they transform these proteins into their own uh, proteins and collagen, for instance. So, in uh, leather uh, pipe products, uh, we have uh, collagen proteins. What happens then? Well, mm, the, the leather is then transformed and becomes a durable material. But the wastes, leather wastes, consist of collagen fibers, so I can recover the collagen fibers, or I can break down collagen fibers in proteins and amino acids and give this back to uh, nature, if you want. And I can use them as uh, um, biostimulants or fertilizers to um, help plants grow. So I can close my circle with a very important element. In this way, I have CO2 fixed in animal proteins inside a circle. I do not uh, release new CO2 in the environment. So I produce basically materials without contributing to climate change. And the advantage to plants is massive because if I provide them with the proteins, plants do not need to um, you know, to use up lots of energy to produce CO2. They, plants can thus boost their production, improve their blossoms, etc. So, in a way, I help plants uh, thrive and compensate for a number of uh, factors that can induce stress, like uh, climate change, for instance. Now, what are the, uh, the sectors in terms of recycled and recovered materials? The main destination of the end of life uh, cuttings from leather is agriculture and food. You can produce uh, jellies. Um, or um, substances to um, add clearance to drinks, but also uh, collagen can be recovered for pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. Also, leather, in order to, I mean, in addition to contributing to the farm to fork strategy, also improves uh, living spaces. It's uh, possible to use um, uh, leather uh, waste uh, products when it comes to uh, plasterboard panels that can replace uh, uh, traditional panels in concrete, for instance. And also, um, another great uh, use of uh, um, leather waste uh, is glue. Uh, organic glue can be produced with cuttings or uh, leather waste. So the idea is to produce bio-based chemical products. Then here you see an idea of applications for collagen fibers. I can create, uh, for instance, uh, a paper, or I can have uh, um, packaging solutions as well as uh, interior design and building sector. It is important it is important to bear in mind that the sustainable development goals cannot be reached alone. To achieve them, you need to work as a team. We all need to give our contribution in order to, to produce ongoing improvement. And so 
Our industry is constantly working to develop synergies. We uh, produce the leather manifesto for the COP26 in Glasgow. We um, supported uh, uh, the uh, Terra Carta initiative by uh, Prince Charles. We also signed an agreement with the um, WWF to uh, promote and define uh, jointly um, criteria to define the sustainability of the sector. And we also joined the Global Com Compact in uh, 2022. So ultimately, it's about engaging and defining together best solutions. And last but not least, the uh, quite a, a sensitive issues, that is to say ethics. Leather, we said, is a natural uh, material of animal origin. And so this is something that needs to be uh, tackled. Leather is a byproduct. Uh, cattle is killed uh, for its meat, not for the leather. But uh, animals are living beings. And therefore, it is important to focus on animal welfare. Nobody cares about the well-being of plants uh, when they are grown, but people do worry about animal welfare, and it is becoming increasingly important. So um, the link, and, and also because the link between animal rearing and deforestation is established, and so the entire industry is trying to become increasingly transparent on this. So we started off with the manifesto in 2015. In 2019, with the veterinary faculty of uh, Milan, we um, mapped uh, the main characteristics of animal welfare for the markets where um, Italian tanneries source themselves. And then in 2020, we started uh, um, a study uh, which is the traceability of sustainable uh, value chains by UNISA, so it's a UN program. And the idea here is to establish cooperation uh, with uh, along the, the supply chain to try and basically promote transparency when it comes to animal welfare, but also deforestation. Our industry uses uh, leather from area that could uh, potentially be uh, prone to risk of deforestation, such as Brazil, for instance. But uh, also, we uh, got equipped with validated tools, tools uh, validated by uh, non-governmental organizations. We asked, for instance, the approval of the National Wildlife Federation uh, from the US so that we could receive an unbiased opinion about uh, criteria um, to assess um, supplies from uh, Southern America. And uh, um, I'm ready to, you know, to deep um, dive on this. And if you um, scan the QR code, uh, you will be able to download the sustainability report. This is also available on the website so that you can get uh, details of, uh, of what I've just mentioned. Um, we also um, take into serious consideration the feedback we get uh, from the different users along the supply chain. So uh, please uh, make sure you give us your feedback and idea. Thank you. This is very interesting, Fabiana, enlightening, I would say. It gave us lots of food for, for thought. We might ask you a few questions there. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I am Lorenzo Quattrini, and uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Renovo. 
The other co-founder is uh, Giuseppe Perigo. Uh, he had a bit of last-minute inconvenience, and we are replacing him. Is this microphone better? Yes, definitely. Shall we send on the video, please? No, no, okay. Excellent. Sound is back. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank uh, the MIPAL organizers and the MIRTA team who supported us these days. Today, I would like to share with you or to introduce you to a young startup. I think that uh, it fits perfectly with the idea of a circular economy. Now, what are we doing? What do we do? Let's see if I can show you. Nope. Okay, and that. Allora, che okay, cosa here we are. Noi essenzialmente uh, basically, Renovo siamo una start che si is a startup that focuses on the restoration of luxury handbags, and we do it in an innovative way because we try to combine two worlds, that is to say craftsmanship linked to restoring because each bag is individual and requires specific care. So really, um, our work is, tailor, uh, is, is tailored, is bespoke, bespoke, and then uh, we combine that with an e-commerce experience. So we restore bags, but we do it through a web platform. So the way we get in touch with customers, uh, quotation and also payment happens in a digital setting. So everything happens, as I said, on our web platform. When we kicked off with Claudio and then Giuseppe, we basically wanted to give our contribution to sustainability. And so the two words that define our projects are sustainability, because ultimately, if you restore a, a, an item, you put it back into the economy. So sustainability is really our focus. And our next, uh, our other buzzword is made in Italy. We work with artisans who um, have been doing their job for 50 years. It's the very same people who produce the bags that then restore them. So their know-how is long-standing, really. Once again, what defines us, again, are these two words, sustainability and made in Italy. We said that this company is young. Well, we were founded last May. We officially started our activity at the end of the year. And then uh, we uh, actually started to 
function on the market uh, in uh, January uh, 2022. We focused on international B2C, and soon enough, um, it's a matter of weeks, uh, we shall start working with international markets and we will work with B2B. So we will try and uh, become a sort of key interface for um, stores as well and intermediaries. We've been operating for a month and uh, thinking that we want to go international soon might seem a bit unrealistic, but we can do that because we are young, it's true, but we are dwarves on the shoulders of giants. We are a spin-off of a long-standing uh, company and experience, which means we have the necessary knowledge. Now, a couple of words on the founders. I am Lorenzo Quattrino. Currently, I am the CEO of Renovo. Then we have Claudio, who is going to introduce himself, and Giuseppe, who is not here. He is our marketing and communication uh, director. Claudio is really the heart of Renovo, the financial heart of it. We are a young startup, but we can run fast and overcome the typical hurdles a startup face. That is to say, uh, scale up and go uh, to markets quickly. Well, it is because Claudio and Giuseppe, in addition to being the founders of Renovo, were also the founders and general managers of two major entities uh, when it comes to this group. So um, they're not simple industrial partners or strategic partners. It's much more. So when I say that Renovo was set up a couple of months ago, but uh, our artisans have been working for 50 years, and the reason is um, that we have strong links and strong synergies with uh, Claudio. This means we can have and guarantee top quality. What we do is unique to us as Claudio will tell you. Our logistics ability is quite amazing, and also um, the ability to uh, process large volumes. If we get 1,000 requests in a couple of weeks, we are in a position to do so. Why? Well, because we avail ourselves of facilities and structures that are flexible enough, and such a level of flexibility can be achieved only many years after. But, Claudio, I'll give you the floor. Yes, as uh, Lorenzo has explained to you, our company, PCSRL, has been uh, working for many years with leather. We produce for large brands. We have a company that initially was a family-owned um, company. So it was initially myself, my brother, uh, my mom, and my father. Then, over the years, we really, um, you know, developed our know-how and uh, we uh, developed a production of 135,000 items. We have more than 200 employees. We have three production sites, one of which is totally dedicated to logistics. Why am I saying so? Well, because uh, Renovo, for me, is uh, my beating heart, if you want. We are working on sustainability, clearly, and um, it's close to my heart because when we started thinking of this idea, I thought it was it was great. Um, my brother and myself represent the second generation, but I have a nephew who's almost 18, and he's coming into our company as well. This is a, represents a value to me, but it also brings a responsibility. And it's um, it deals also, it is a matter of, you know, community. Uh, we're based in Naples. 
strategica dedicata um, da Lorenzo ha, well, ha portato in mente l'innovazione, l'innovazione che ha subito Lorenzo previsto un corso innovation. So what we did is we organized a training session with 14 la media età master anzi, la massima crafts. età è di 60 anni, una media Mind età you, di 25 anni. Uh, 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 e abbiamo creato questo work is are 60 e and the youngest are 25. Poter lavorare in sinergia. So we developed questi 15 master craft li abbiamo dedicati a una formazione di altri 21 master persone uh, crafts che possono dedicarsi and uh, we subsequently trained another 21 workers who can be totally dedicated to Renovo. So this ultimate Sì, che permette is, alle nuove uh, generazioni if you want a, a, a social element that can bring in new projects for the younger generations. And younger generations can be, if you want, enticed to working with us. So we really want to um, encourage them and entice their interest. And uh, it is fascinating, you know, to give a new lease of life to uh, products that can last much, much longer. And it is something that really resonates with uh, young people. And that um, meant uh, we could structure ourselves in-house uh, on this. I um, am in charge of the production, and uh, if need be, I can give full support to the production. I am co-founder of Renovo, and I am a strong believer in it. I think it is forward thinking, and I uh, I am convinced it can represent a great way to regenerate a product because um, we have the underlying expertise to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. I wanted Claudio to take uh, the floor because behind the circular economy there is a topic that Claudio is focusing on and that is to say social sustainability and I wanted to mention the social element. Not a couple of words on Renovo to finish up. It is key to have this partnership because we can scale up easily on national and international markets. Having said uh, this, what is our ambition? Our ambition is to become the key player, both national and international, for leather goods restoration. It is ambitious, but we are convinced it is feasible. Why am I saying that? A couple of words on the market. We work on the second-hand market, clearly. Let me share with you a couple of elements here. This market is growing. It grows four times as much as the new market. Why is it growing so much? Well, because people like the idea of vintage products, you can only find second-hand bags if you're looking to, for some models, and also prices. A second-hand bag costs half the price of a new bag, and also uh, because of sustainability. Now, the interesting aspect is that in the last three, four elements, um, the ranking of this basically changed. If in the past the key reason to buy second-hand was price, now the key reason for buying second-hand is um, sustainability. And the interesting uh, thing is that although there are many second-hand uh, players, both national and international, nobody provides restoration services. That's why we are so ambitious to think that we can become the key player because there's no such thing like us in the world. And that's why we want to run fast on this market. Our values, we have already uh, mentioned them, so I will quickly run through them. Sustainability, I've said, quality, Claudio told you, and last but not least, trust. All of our processes are digital. Uh, it is embedded in our uh, platform, and every single step is traced. So consumers know exactly at what stage of the process they are, uh, at what stage of restoration, they can track the shipment, everything. 
And then there's one uh, other element I want to stress. If we are not sure we can uh, restore a bag properly, we just say no. We started at the beginning of the year and we received 700 requests, so the market is out there. But we cannot cater to everyone's needs because sometimes if we can't provide optimal results, we prefer to turn requests down. So that is why trust is so important to us. What else can I add? Well, Claudio told you about quality. Just a couple of words on customer service. Customer service is key because ultimately uh, today, excellent customer service is what makes the difference. We provide quotes within 24 hours and we are able to process many requests quickly. We also have uh, um, customer, dedicated customer service 24-7. So really, that's all from us. Um, and to summarize, why Renovo? Well, three key elements that uh, make us unique. We are young, very young startup, but um, we have a broad uh, shoulders and a strong uh, structure um, that can support us. We really focus on quality and customer service. Often, I call up customers to ask whether they were happy with with uh, the service they received. And finally, we are fully digital and integrated. We do not have basically a brick and mortar store that does restoration. We are a fully uh, digital company. So the processes we use are different uh, from your average company. It was great um, to be here with you and thank you for your attention.